Good morning and welcome to Revive, everybody. Uh, for all that are here as regular people that usually attend, welcome. And to those that are guests, like our uh, friend here in the front here, Dan Bedard, welcome this morning. And uh, to anybody else that didn't say hello or is new to the church, uh, we welcome you as well. And please feel free to greet, come up to us and talk to us, and we're more than happy to welcome you this morning. So, um, give everybody a chance to find a seat. Um, yeah, just uh, notice in the world today, there's a lot of strife going on, uh, whether it is in the Middle East or it's even in our own country, politically. Um, we ask for God to be in this, this moment with us and to carry us through this, these uh, very uncertain times. Uh, so I'll ask you to bow your heads and we'll pray. Father God, uh, we lift up this time to you. Uh, we ask you to come before us and put your spirit upon us as we, as we just want to praise you and worship you this morning. And uh, thank you for all that we have as a, as a church, as a, as a country. Um, for there is so much strife in the world, Lord, and uh, we, we lift up our brothers and sisters in the Middle East, and uh, we just ask you to bring peace and calmness and uh, love back over there, Lord. And uh, we ask that your will would be done, Lord. Uh, you know uh, where the end is, and uh, you know uh, how things will turn out. So we lift these things all up to you, Lord. Just ask for Canada itself to be a country of peace, and uh, but a country that stands up for itself as well, Lord. That we would recognize you as as the Lord and Savior, Lord. And uh, we ask for a revival across this country, Lord, across this country. And uh, with political uncertainness in the United States, Lord, we just ask that you put your hand upon that, Lord, and that you guide it guide them in making the correct decision, Lord, and uh, let it be your will. And I lift all these things up to you, Lord Jesus. Amen. Announcements. Happening this week. Uh, these slides are all your weekly uh, email, are in your email, so please take note of the dates, times, and locations. Mark them on your calendar. Uh, if you don't receive our weekly emails, uh, please give us your email following the service, and uh, we will get you on the list. Um, if you don't have an email, we have a few flyers with the upcoming dates that you can take home at the back of the church. Upcoming events. Youth contact Rebecca Goulet for more info. And then men's breakfast, second Saturday of the month at the Alexandria Pizzeria. Good time of fellowship for, for the men of this church. Um, worship song request book. There is a worship song book located at the front of the church. If you have a hymn or worship song you would like to sing, please add it to the book, and our worship team will do the best to add them in. If you're considering baptism or would like to know more, uh, please contact Pastor Errol. And as well, if you're looking for more information about membership, please talk to Pastor Errol or someone in leadership. FunFit will be starting back up on October 26th from 10 to 11 at the North Glengarry Alliance Church on Marku Road and the cost of the class is $2. And if you have any questions, please contact Robin Mohammed. Um, ladies' Night Out, for all the ladies of the church, November 13th, mark your calendars. Invite your friends and bring a treat to share. And then after the service, new to Canada English practice will be happening. Uh, everyone is welcome, as we need folks to 
uh, chat uh, with those who are learning English. And that's all for this morning. Um, now I'm going to invite Ruben up for a creation moment and uh, a nice teaching time. We haven't had one in a long time, so I'm looking forward to it, Ruben. So you know last time that I did it a couple months ago, we ended day one. And just to summarize day one, God, he started time, he created matter, and he made space. So what we have at the end of day one, then he put this, all the water together into a, a, a ball, a spherical ball, that's what the scriptures tell us. So what we have at the end of day is an energized ball of watery substance uh, and with a light source that was not the sun. And all the physical laws of nature at this point have been put in place. Gravity, gas laws, atomics, subatomic, nuclear, they're all been put in place by the Holy Spirit. That's, so all that happened in that day one and it's in scriptures. So now, we start with creation day number two. And God said, let there be expanse in the midst of the waters and let it separate the waters from the waters. And God made the expanse and separated the waters that were under the expanse from the waters that were above the expanse. And it was so. And God called the expanse heaven, and there was evening and there was morning in the second day. So the word atmosphere wasn't created in 1648. Well, it was created only on 1648. So since this book, the Bible was written thousands of years ago, an explanation of the atmosphere is this. Kind of makes sense. Separation of this watery mass. And uh, the heavens is, is a word that the Bible uses where, you know, it talks about the heavens and the sky, but also the heavens of where the birds fly. So there's verses that correlate that here we're talking about the atmosphere. So I don't know about you. When you take a look at a picture from of Earth from out of space, and you kind of take a look at this little blue hinge here. It's kind of scary. I don't know if we, sometimes I wonder that everything could just get sucked out, you know, into space and we all perish and stuff. We know it's not going to happen, but it is precarious, right? I mean, you're taking a look at the, the, the blue Earth, you know, and it's like, wow, that's really beautiful. But man, it's so delicate, it seems, right? So the, the atmosphere, as you can see, that little thin blue line there, is a watery blanket, okay? And it protects and supports life on Earth. It's a bit like our skin on our bodies, okay? It's a good example to, 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 to think about. The skin protects us from, you know, outside, you know, like hits, keeps our st stomach intestines together, keeps our muscles intact. And, uh, and just like the atmosphere, it protects us from Earth, from radiation and meteors. And, and it holds in the water vapor and heat. So just a little technical term, and you can see it is separated into five layers. A, a lot like our sin is separated into different layers, and if every layer has a function. All right, we're not going to get into that today, but every layer is really important. Just for a few examples of the atmosphere, what it does. If the Earth had the next slide, a thinner atmosphere, we would be hit from incoming rocks, meteors, harmful radiation, and we would be pocketed, just like the moon is, with space dust, little tiny rocks, everything that comes from space, we would be hit. But the Earth, as you can see from the right side picture, it burns these things up. Most of them get burned up in the atmosphere, so we are protected that way. So it acts a bit like our skin as a protection from external sources. It also has this hydrological cycle. You all learned this in grade school, right? But what a couple of good points is that the evaporated water goes into the atmosphere and it stays there for about 10 days. So that's the cycle of water, 10 days in the atmosphere, and then it comes back down. And that's pretty much the entire Earth is like that because of the atmosphere. So there's billions of gallons of water in, at every moment in our skies billions of gallons. It's only 0.1 or less than 0.1% of the total water that we have on Earth, but there's a lot of water in our skies. Mm -hmm. 
And the funny thing is it protects us from radiation. But it's not so opaque that it lets some radiation get through to give life to plants and to give us essential nutrients like vitamin E. We get our vitamin E from the sunlight, right? So it allows things to come through, but blocks the harmful things from not coming through. And it's not opaque like other planets, like Venus or Jupiter, where from Earth, we can see the, the heavens. And this is one of the reasons why God created the heavens and the stars, so we can observe the stars for signs and wonders and to see his majesty. But we wouldn't be able to see that for in many other planets in the solar system. So are these a created design, or is it just by chance? So finally, we're going to be, I'm going to be introducing you this scientific idea about the Goldilocks principle. You know the story of Goldilocks? She goes into the forest, and she goes into the, uh, a house, and she sees three beds, and one's right for her. And she sees that she has some porridge, and just one's right for her. Well, the Goldilocks principle is that for, in order for life for us to live on, there has to be the right things to happen. And if you take a look, the Goldilocks, and when, when people look for other habitable planets, they look for this Goldilocks zone. And it has to be that small little area of blue where our, where our Earth is. Other than that, life as we know it cannot exist. So this, our planet is pretty unique. And the only hope that people without God have is since there's billions of planets or suns out there, there's got to be a, an Earth like ours. But there hasn't been any found. But we're still looking, and it's fine to look. The point is, our planet is very unique, and God created it so. So I'll finish up with Isaiah 45, 18. For this is what the Lord says. He who created the heavens, he is God. He has fashioned and made the earth. He founded it. He did not create it to be empty, but formed it to be inhabited. He says, I am the Lord, and there is no other. And that's the end of day two. Thank you, Ruben. Um, one thing, uh, one of the announcements I did miss uh, was uh, there is a seven-week study uh, men's Bible small group uh, called Seven Challenges Men Encounter, and it's going to be hosted by Dave Smith at his place. And actually, Dave, why don't you come up and talk about it, please? Yeah. Beautiful. Before I muck it up. Yeah, that was a great creation moment, too, wasn't it? I want to just say that uh, several weeks ago, well, let me just backtrack here and say I work part-time at Home Depot for a couple days a week as I serve as a coach there to uh, help with the training. And I got to tell you, never in my life have I seen more confused bunch of young men coming through the ranks. You know, we just look at our newspapers and we see about uh, gender dysphoria, we see, uh, uh, you know, biological men and women's sports, we see so many areas that, uh, you know, 50, over a 50% divorce rate. And I work with these guys, and, and I'm just amazed with just how lost they are. Like, it just seems so much worse now than it, it has been, and not to send up a big flare, but I mean, there, there really is a very significant problem in the roles of men and women in our culture and society. So uh, a few months back, we had, uh, as we organized the uh, Alexandria Men's Ministry, we had about 25 guys in my basement and we did a presentation, we talked about what is it that the topics that men really want. And so I put together a study uh, called The Seven Challenges That Men Encounter. It's, uh, it's really a, a groundbreaking kind of a, a real basic fundamental things and grounding us in scripture, grounding us as men with what our roles are according to God, not according to culture and society. So uh, it's gonna start not tomorrow, but a week tomorrow, 
but uh, I don't know what your theology of fleeces are, but I did lay out a fleece before the Lord and said we need seven men to make this study fly, to have a small group of seven men. And we're far short of that number right now. And uh, not to lay a guilt trip on anybody, but uh, it's going to be a great study. And I would say to you, I know that we're all busy and uh, there's a lot of stuff going on through the activities. You can see there's a lot of things happening. And I just want to say to you today that uh, if the Lord is tugging on your shoulder about this area and it's, uh, it's an area that you want to address and be part of, uh, I'll be at the back of the church following the service and be happy to take down names. Like I said, we need seven. We're far short of that right now. If we get them, we get them. If not, I'll count that as a sign that God wants to do it at a later date. But uh, I will be at the back of the church, and uh, I just want to thank you for your thoughts and prayers on the men's ministry. Uh, I know it's a, it's a tough slug out there, and when you're out in the trenches, you realize just how, how confused so many men are. But uh, God has placed us, perhaps, in this place for such a time as this, to be those beacons, to be those men that uh, others can reach out to, and we can uh, help to provide guidance and direct them towards uh, what God's biblical role is for men, help them to find their way. And so that's my heart's desire in it. And I'll be at the back of the church if you're, if you're available. And if not, then we'll, we'll postpone it. But either way, I'm good with it either way. But uh, I'm not laying a guilt trip on you. I'm just saying if the Lord's speaking to you, then, uh, then, then uh, rise to the occasion. And if not, then uh, we'll do it later. Thanks very much, Dave. Yeah, that's very good. Very important ministry. Uh, I agree 100% with you there. Um, so now uh, I will invite up the music team. Uh, Andre, Serge, Maddie, Jenny, Jack. Come on up. Good morning. Am I on? Oh, I guess I'm on. Last week, uh, Pastor Erwell had said, uh, you know, uh, are you in or are you out? Do you, can you sing? Can you play? Can you, you know? And I'm sitting there, and I was going to look at Andre, because we used to sing. So we're just old guys. That... <laughs> anyway. And I, and, I, and I, but nope, nope, can't do this, you know? And so what does he do? He calls me the next day, and he goes, hey, you want to sing? So just, just uh, and lately I've been reading, obviously reading in the Bible, and then some verses are standing out, and it's like, don't let the fears and the worries of the world stop you. So you know, just 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 go, go, you know, uh, go in all the way and do as the Lord. Like like last week, he was talking to me. Look at him. You know. Nope. Nope. Can't do that. But here we are. So uh, we're, we're taking off some cobwebs, and we're hoping you guys will uh, be a little patient with us. That's what love is all about. Can I get another 10 seconds? Can we just, because you know, God says when, when we come to worship Him, He sits in the midst of worship. And he wants us to praise him in truth and sincere heart. So this morning, I'd like to take, ask you and for myself to 10 seconds to thank him from the heart, not from the head, because from the head, you might say, you know, you should have seen my week. But from the heart is, Lord, you brought me through and I'm here today. And where else will I go anyways? You are so worthy to be praised. And I want to take 10 seconds from the heart, can you tell him, thank you, Lord, for what you've done in my life, for saving me, for getting me through all this? Or maybe you had a great week, and Lord, thank you. And So just take 10 seconds from the heart to thank him that we're here today and that we can gather and, and come into his presence. Because I'm, I'm just letting you know, we never know what can happen when we're in the presence of the Lord. We never know. And he is so worthy to be praised. So just take 10 seconds, please, to... To thank him from your from your heart. (laughs) 
Every knee shall bow, every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord and forever. Every knee shall bow, every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord and forever. Can't stop praising His name. Can't stop praising His name. Can't stop. Praising the name of Jesus. Can't stop praising His name. Can't stop praising His name. Can't stop praising the name of Jesus. Every knee shall bow. Every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord and forever. Every knee shall bow, every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord and forever. Can't stop praising His name, can't stop praising His name, can't stop praising the name of Jesus. Can't stop praising His name, can't stop praising His name. Praising the name of Jesus. Tu genou fléchira, tu te bouche confessera que Jésus est Seigneur et pour toujours. Tu genou fléchira, tu te bouche confessera que Jésus est Seigneur et pour toujours. Sans cesse. Je veux louer, sans cesse, je veux louer, sans cesse, je veux louer le nom de Jésus. Sans cesse, je veux louer, sans cesse, je veux louer, sans cesse, je veux louer le nom de Jésus. Every knee shall bow, every tongue confess. Christ is Lord and forever. Every knee shall bow, every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord and forever. Can't stop praising His name. Can't stop praising His name. Can't stop praising the name of Jesus. Can't stop praising His name. Can't stop praising His name. Can't stop praising the name of Jesus. Of Jesus. Of Jesus. Can't stop. Hallelujah. Give Him a praise. He is worthy to be praised. Lead me, and I will follow you all of 
my days and step by step you lead me and I will follow you all of my days and step by step you lead me and I will follow you all of my days amen Amen. This is a very old song, but how true it is. It's only because he lives that we can face tomorrow. That's it. Turn around and tell somebody it's all because of him. It's all because of him. Mm -hmm. It's not a because what we're doing. It's all because of Him. <clears throat> because He lives, I can face tomorrow. Because He lives, all fear.
Tu es mon roi, tu es celui en qui je crois. Tu es mon Père, tu es mon roi, tu es celui en qui je crois. Let us pray. We give you all the glory. We give you all the praise, O oh God. For you are the creator and the sustainer of this earth. The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. The world and all that dwell therein. You are our God. You are our King. Beside you there is no other. 
So we honor you, we praise you, we glorify your name, we lift you up this morning. We pray that our worship will come up to you as a sweet-smelling fragrance. So accept the sacrifice of praise we bring, O oh God, in the midst of the trials and the tribulations and the testing. Accept the praise and the glory we give to you. So may our worship, Lord, please you today. And as we worship and as we praise you, may your Holy Spirit move among us, speak to us, and draw us closer to yourself. Lord, we remember Pastor Bruce, we pray that you will touch his body and heal him, Father. Uh, remember those among us who are not well, who have asked for prayers. We pray that you would enter into their situation as well. Heal and deliver, we pray. So hear our prayer, Lord, and let our cry come to you. For we pray in Jesus' name. And everyone said, Amen. At this time, uh, I'd like to dismiss the children. from the uh, prayer request this morning. Uh, first prayer request is for Faith Ann. She's feeling unwell this morning. We want to please pray for a settled stomach and, and healing. Also, I want to pray for Ivan's family in Cuba because Cuba is undergoing a uh, hurricane at the moment and also a, uh, a major power, power failure on their, on their power grid. Um, so um, I was asking for a prayer that his family's home is not touched and that uh, no one would be hurt. And there is an ongoing prayer for Bruce, um, for his well-being. Um, good reports on monthly blood tests sent to Ottawa, so um, it seems like um, right now he's doing well and he does not need to come back, so we want to be thankful and prayerful that God is keeping him where he, where he sent him, him and Birgit, so. And then I want to pray for um, our brother Luke Seguin, who is uh, currently at the Ottawa Civic Hospital. Uh, on Friday, he, uh, he fell off a roof and, um, well, I shouldn't say he fell off roof. He fell when he was doing a roof, and he fell on a hammer, and um, it uh, it did something pretty severe because uh, uh, our brother Andre uh, met him, and he was not looking very well, and he made him go to the hospital again, and uh, they removed about one and a half liters of fluid from one of his lungs. So now they transferred him to Ottawa, and. Uh, He's under the care of the doctors, so I please pray for the doctor's wisdom and care and uh, a rebound for our brother. And then uh, there's prayer for hope, uh, that God would continue to heal old wounds and transform broken sinners. Amen. Father God, uh, there's a lot of brokenness in this, in this world, and... Uh, we, we need you, Lord. You are our guide through all this, and uh, you heal all, all wounds, and uh, whether they are physical or mental, Lord, you are there, and uh, we just need to reach out to you and uh, 
ask for you, cry out to you, Lord. That's all you ask, and uh, you give us relief. Um, Lord, we just uh, we ask for for those that are undergoing uh, medical medical um, procedures, Lord. Uh, please be with them, Lord. Uh, give them guidance. Uh, give the doctors guidance, and uh, just give them your healing, Lord, your healing hand upon them. And those that are maybe just at home that are not feeling well, Lord, just also place your hand of healing upon them so that they would uh, just be able to rebound back, Lord, and uh, just worship and praise you. And uh, Lord, protect those in, in, in other countries um, that uh, are undergoing uh, strife, Lord, and, uh, and those that are facing climate change uh, that uh, is causing a tremendous amount of hurricanes, Lord. So we ask that you put your hand of protection over Cuba, Lord, and uh, restore the power that they, they, they have lost, Lord, and that there would be strategies in order to restore it and protect them from the hurricane that is coming upon them, Lord. And uh, we just want to lift all these things up to you, Lord Jesus. Amen. Now I'd like to welcome Pastor Errol. I believe. Oh, sorry. My fault. Skipping a step. Uh, scripture reading. You? My daughter was supposed to do it, but she had to pass. So. Okay. All right. Second change of plans. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right. Sorry. Uh, my daughter has to work today, so she can't do the reading. Um, do you have one too? Are you supposed to do it now? Okay, so, oh, wow, hi. So, this morning, um, I'm reading from Ephesians chapter 2, verses 19 to 22, if you want to follow along. You Gentiles are no longer strangers and foreigners. You are citizens with everyone else who belongs belongs to the family of God. You are like buildings with apostles and prophets as the foundation and with Christ as most important stone. Christ is the one who holds the building together and makes it grow into a holy temple for the Lord. And you are a part of that building Christ has built as a place for God's own spirit to live. The next one is Acts 2, 38 to 47. It says, Peter replied, All of you must turn away from your sins and be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. Then your sins will be forgiven. You will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. The promise is for you and your children. It is also for all who are far away. It is for all whom the Lord our God will choose. Peter said many other things to warn them. He begged them, save yourselves from these evil people. Those who accepted his message were baptized. About 3,000 people joined the believers that day. The believers studied what the apostles taught. They shared their lives together. They ate and prayed together. Everyone was amazed at what God was doing. They were amazed when the apostles performed many wonders and signs. All the believers were together. They shared everything they had. They sold property and other things they owned. They gave to anyone who needed something. Every day they met together in the temple courtyard. They ate meals together in their homes. Their hearts were glad and sincere. They praised God. They were respected by all the people. Every day the Lord added to their group those who were being saved. Thank you, Silas. Thank you, Oksana. Now, I will welcome Pastor Earl to the pulpit. Thank you to the worship team and Renee for leading and everybody else who has participated, who have read and who didn't read. Wonderful. Thank you all for participating and uh, for helping to make this a blessed experience. Wasn't that good, really good worship?
power. <laughs> oh, man. And, and can you imagine, th these people only kind of came together within the week, right? One week. Wonderful. Let's see what the Lord can do when we allow Him to use us. Dave, thank you very much for the men's ministry. I was at the last breakfast uh, where Ruben gave his testimony. I understand you've been doing that for a while. Um, Dave also, in his encouragement for us to participate, is a very, he's very generous and, and gentle and kind. But his email did say that nobody had signed up yet when I got that email. Nobody. Zero. So I'd like to make just one comment on that, which is to say that um, even those of us who have been serving the Lord for a while have a duty and a responsibility to mentor younger men. So in one way or the other, we ought to avail ourselves of some of this kind of training and discussion and conversation. I can tell you, as somebody who gave his heart and life to the Lord, and I know the, the, the sound is, is kind of a wavering a little bit. I'm not sure why. Um, but as someone who gave his heart and life to the Lord at 15 years old, I can tell you, if it wasn't for some of the older young people and for some of the older men, in fact, I had... I was adopted, in fact, by one deacon from the church that I attended. He just saw me and watched me all over the place and so on, and he just said, you know what? I want to adopt that young man. Looks like he has potential. And uh, when, I, when I decided to go into the ministry, he just... He just cried. He couldn't speak for a while. They asked him to share something. He couldn't, he couldn't speak because he was looking at the product of his involvement in the life of somebody who could have gone easily. Could you take me down a little bit, please? I'm getting some reverb here, <laughs> and I'm, I haven't even gotten excited yet. <laughs> <laughs> take me down a little bit, please, and uh, maybe you could take down the, uh, yeah, so it doesn't reverb. That's better. Okay, that's better. Um, yeah, you know, I, I easily, oh, by the way, I'm giving testimony next time we meet, right, for breakfast, so those who want to hear the full story, I invite you, the men. Sorry. Um, yeah, if you want to hear the full story, you can, you can come. I could easily have gone the other way, easily. Because my family, part of my family, were the ones who were leaders in one of the gangs. So it was really easy for me. But Jesus reached down and grabbed a hold of me. That's why I'm here today. So we give thanks for that. So I want to encourage... Thank you. Yeah, thanks for that too. Uh, when, when, uh, when, when, when my brother spoke earlier and he said, let's, let's give thanks, people were so quiet. I didn't even hear nobody. And please mind, forgive my poor grammar there, but that's okay. Um, <laughs> yeah, you know, if we were a Pentecostal church and you said, give thanks and pray, they'd start to speak, okay? And so that's quite all right. All right, that's quite all right. Okay, 
So those are my initial comments, and also I join in the welcome to those who, uh, who are visiting with us. Wonderful, good to have you. Um, there's a rule that nobody knows about that I've just made up. You gotta come about 12 times before you decide that you're not gonna come again, okay? 12, yeah, yeah, 12. 12. All right. We're in a series that I've called The Essentials. The first essential we've talked about is Christology. The second is ecclesiology. And we're going to continue our second, service, second sermon in the series on ecclesiology. So I've called it Ecclesia or Ecclesia 2. Last week was number one. Today is number two. One of my closing comments last week was, are you in or are you out? That's a very important question. And I'd I like to disturb some of you a little bit by saying there's some of us who think we're in and we're out. The challenge is today we have a body called the church that as Ed Silvoso said in his book that I referred to last week, which I'll, I'll also mention today, he says the early church and the apostolic age of the church and what we have today are two completely different things. The early church was made up of, first of all, by 12 apostles I think you can take me down a little bit more. Uh, Twelve apostles who they said, the scripture said, some people in Antioch and Alexandria actually said, but these men are unlearned, unsophisticated, and they have turned the world upside down. And today we have, depending on the numbers, 2.5 to 2.9 billion people who claim to be Christians. And yet the world is in so much mess today that you have to wonder. I, it was, I, was, I went through a little period of, I would call it depression, when, when, when I go back to Jamaica, which is my home country, and sometimes I see and hear and read and listen, and I'm wondering, what has happened? Because there are more churches in New York City and Jamaica than any other part of the world, they say. Every other corner there is a church. One of these days when I preach and I mention some church names I've seen in New York, in New York it, will, it will just blow your mind. That, that, you know, one, one stretch of between that road back there and this road here, there are like five churches between on this side and on that side. And one church is uh, the, her the Holy Church of God. Uh, the next church is the very Holy Church of God. Uh, uh, the next one down the road. I mean, I, and yet there is so much evil. And so I want to say to us today that this church that Jesus Christ said he was going to build is a special, unique group of people called his disciples. Not believers, which is a fairly modern term in the early 20th century. They started to call Christians believers. Well, people today believe all kinds of things about church and about God and about the Bible and about Jesus Christ that are just not true. How do I come by that? I've read the book. And I keep reading the book. And sometimes I listen to some of my colleague pastors preach and I'm wondering, for the life of me, where did they get that from? I, it makes me wonder sometimes. I am 
baffled, literally. But let me get to my text and the slides that you, <laughs> you are going to look at over there. Oh, I've got to turn it on first. Okay, good. All right, there we go. But let's pray. Father, in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, speak to us through your word. And bring glory to your name and your name alone. May Jesus Christ be lifted up among us today. For he promised, if I am lifted up, I will draw all men unto me. So open our eyes, Lord. Remove the scales from our eyes. Open our ears and help us to open our hearts to believe. This we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. If we ask people across North America to define the church and to tell us how the church, by definition, should operate, that's not there. You have just the, the uh, bullet points, in a manner of speaking. Uh, we'll get as many answers as the people we are asking, in fact. Uh, to, to properly answer the question, we must first ask ourselves, what is the origin of this thing called the church? And what is the reason for Jesus' mission on the earth? Put another way, why did Jesus come to earth? And what is God seeking to accomplish? Again, I mentioned Ed Silvozo. He wrote a book entitled Ecclesia, God's Instrument for Global transformation. He points out that God's plan is not just individual salvation, but global transformation. How did he come by that? Well, the Father wants to redeem and reclaim and recover all that the enemy has stolen. The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. The world and all that dwell therein. And one prophecy, prophecy by Habakkuk, says that one day the earth shall be filled with the glory, with the knowledge of God as the waters cover the sea. What has the enemy stolen? The enemy has stolen the soul of mankind the soul of humanity. Scripture tells us that the enemy, the devil, Satan, has a modus operandi and an overriding strategic objective. And he comes, John chapter 10, verse 10, Jesus said, the thief comes to steal, kill, and Destroy. But I have come, Jesus said, that, I might, that they might have life and have it more abundantly. Scripture warns us that unless we're in, then we are out. That's very logical, isn't it? Not very profound. But in the word ecclesia, as defined for you last week, two words, ek, E-K, and then K-L-E-S-I-A, called out. The ek called from. The ecclesia called to. And so this body of disciples are called to be a called out set of people who do something. Part of what we're going to talk about today. The early church had a distinct character and engaged in specific practices following the teachings of Jesus Christ and the leading of the Holy Spirit. This change 
sufficiently, uh, this had changed sufficiently by the 15th century, so much so that a man called Martin Luther wrote 95 theses, 95, 95 propositions to say to his organization then that we need to return to God. All kinds of um, bad practices, indulgences, for example. Uh, at one point, the Catholic Church then, uh, <laughs> the priests would sell indulgences. So if you know you were going to sin next week, you could buy some indulgences this week so that you could cash it in afterwards. And Martin Luther said, something is wrong with this. And it led to the Reformations. The first Reformation. Today, many theologians and scholars are, and philosophers actually are saying, we need another Reformation. Today we face similar threats. The threats are in the form of, first, what scholars call the emergent church. Let me use a more popular phrase. Or the seeker-sensitive church. Postmodernism, which is a philosophical idea that we no longer need to rely on certain principles and thoughts and ideas that we had prior to the 19th century. We, we need, we've now become enlightened. The enlightenment. We have become enlightened. So now we don't need to, for example, pray. And the French Revolution was part of, part of the idea was this change from the old guard, if you please, the old model of living and what it means to be moral and ethical and so on, oh, we've gotten a little bit modern. Haven't we gotten more modern today? We have Google. We have Amazon. In fact, if you want, you could on your phone, and we have, uh, what's that one called? Uh, um, uh, something Eats. You, 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 Uber Eats, this one, you could actually, while you're there, which you should not do, you could actually order your dinner. And by the time you get home, it's there waiting for you. We've gotten very advanced today. And so this emergent church and the seeker-sensitive church or the progressive church, and we will get into some of the details of those later on, advocate all kinds of different theologies. You will probably, some of you will recognize the name Robert Schuller or Bill Hybels or come a little closer, Rick Warren and even closer, Andy Stanley. These are uh, pastors who promoted, for example, the Seeker Sensitive church. In fact, those of you, some of you may not know, but you know how um, Saddleback Church started and has grown significantly by Rick Warren, the Purpose Driven Life, the Purpose Driven Church. You, do you know how that church started? When he was doing his thesis, his dissertation, he went around the Californian suburb and he asked what kind of church would you attend if you were to attend church? And he made a list of all the things they said and said, okay, we're going to make a church like that. So you can come to church. Among the things that the seeker-sensitive people said was, don't Talk anything about sin. Don't you, please, we'd rather you be more inclusive. So if I want to believe in somebody else other than Jesus, 
It's okay. And, and this thing about hell, what's that? There's no such thing. So please don't preach about that. And, and don't, don't you make me feel guilty when I come to church because I want to feel comfortable. And so they started a church. So they started a movement. And the mega churches have taken off all over the world. Rick Warren's church has about 30,000 people every Sunday. And the Stanley's church has about 25,000. At least, every Sunday. And, and so on, and so on. What are some of the characteristics of these churches? I give you only three. Number one. Pragmatism and relati relativism. Simply, for example, truth is relative. And, and this is why there are people who, uh, who are you know, mega stars who would come on your daily shows and what have you and say that it is quite okay to serve one, two, three, four, or five different gods. And those are the people who, if they came into town, they come and sit in the front seat. And they get to go on the platform and say whatever they want to say because what they do sometimes is bribe the pastors. If you don't make me feel uncomfortable, I will donate a half a million dollars to your church and to your ministry. One person down in Dallas, Texas, uh, donated a million dollars. Not Canadian. American. And so he got to pray for the pastor. Is he saved? Is he a Christian? No. But he got to pray and lay hands on the pastor and pray for him. So we need another revolution. Today we delve deeper into the purpose and function of the ecclesia as seen in the early church within the context of what should Revive be doing today in Alexandria and Lancaster and Van Cleef Hill and Maxville, 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 right? And where? And Toronto, of course, of course. I want us to rediscover the essence of the early church, the body of Christ. I want us to debunk some myths. And I want us to encourage ourselves, those who have not yet committed themselves to Christ and to the church, to revisit that idea. I want to define three terms that I, you'll hear them more and more as I go, uh, go ahead and and preach uh, at least one or two other sermons on ecclesia or ecclesiology, um, Christocentric, the centrality of Jesus in church. Christocentric th uh, theologies make Christ the central theme of all of the theological positions and doctrines. And so some years ago we had this this thing, <coughs> I'm sorry, what would Jesus do? Or what would Jesus say? Which is a good idea at first. The next word, ecclesia, we'll come back to that later on. Uh, the called out people who form a community of Christ followers. In other words, disciples pursuing the kingdom of God. And the next word, 
transformation. The process by which God saves people from their sins and rebellion and changes them into the person who pursues and follows Jesus Christ. In essence, then, we become change agents. Second Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17 says, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, if he or she becomes a new creation. I see that. Wonderful. All things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. Jesus, God, is after transformation. In the old days, we used to say, the things I used to do, I do them no more. Uh, when we talk about being called out, called from and called to, we talk about, we talk about call out of darkness, out of sin, out of rebellion, out of this attitude to do our own thing, and we become Christ-centered. So, Things I used to do, I do them no more. The old song says, the cross before, uh, the world behind me and the cross before me, I've decided to follow Jesus. No turning back. No turning back. The gates of hell, I mentioned it last week, the gates of hell, which speaks to the power and or authority of hell. Um, Jesus said, and the gates of hell cannot prevail against the church. And what Jesus was saying is that when the church begins to march on and move on to do the things that he wants us to do, even hell cannot prevail against us. In fact, in the book of Ephesians, uh, the Apostle Paul tells us that when Jesus died, he went and he was dead. He, was, he, was, he, was, he died on the cross, and, and there were three days, three days in between when he died and when he rose Paul says he went down into hell and said, give me the keys. Because now I am going to free people. So that when you die, you no longer are banished from the presence of God completely, totally. But now you can be redeemed before you get there. Because once you die, the scripture says, it's appointed unto man once to die. And after that, the judgment. But Jesus went and made it so that now, when we die, in, in fact, Jesus in the Revelation said, I am he that was dead. And behold, I live forevermore. And if you are alive and believe in me, Jesus said, you shall never die. And those who were dead, even they shall live again. Jesus said that to Martha when he was going to raise Lazarus from the dead. Lazarus was dead four days. Jesus came into town. He waited, as a matter of fact, the scripture says, when he got the news. When he got there, Martha said, Lord, <laughs> if you had been here, my brother would not have died. Jesus said, don't worry about it. I have a plan you don't know about. And then he said to her, Martha, do you believe that I, I can raise him from the dead? She said, Lord, I know you can do anything, but this one, I'm not sure. This is the English version. Jesus said, listen, you need to understand, I am the resurrection and the life. Though you were dead, yet you shall live. Behold, if you believe in me, and you're alive, you shall never die. And this is why when, when, when he went to raise the daughter of one of the soldiers, a centurion, he said, she's not dead, but she's just sleeping. And so when Jesus said, the gates of hell cannot prevail against it, he's making a profound statement. In Romans chapter 8, the Apostle Paul picks up on part of that idea, and he says, we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. 
and gave himself for us. So the, 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 the idea then is that when we are part of this, this new group of people called the church, Jesus inaugurated this body and he says, upon this rock. Remember? He's talking to Peter. Peter, he said, now, who do, who do they say I am? And, and, and Peter's, Peter's, some said, you may be John the Baptist, you may be Isaiah, you may be one of the prophets, we don't know exactly. And Jesus said, who do you say that I am? And Peter said, thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. Uh, Jesus said, Peter, flesh and blood did not reveal that. I know you might think you're smart enough, but it didn't come from you. That came from heaven. Flesh and blood did not reveal it unto you, but my Father which is in heaven. And I say to you, listen to me, I, I say to you, on this rock that I am the Christ, the Son of a living God, on this rock I will build my church. And the gates of hell cannot prevail against it. We've already talked about ecclesia. I like how Peter characterized that in 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 9. He says, uh, you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar people, that you might show forth the praise and glory of God while you're here. Called out, called on to. We are the bride of Christ. We are the body of Christ. And Jesus Christ is the head of the church. Christ was most upset when he went into the temple and they were conducting commerce. They were buying and selling, the, the scripture says. He drove them out. He turned over the tables and he drove them out. And he says, my house shall be called a house of prayer. That's a warning to us, my brothers and sisters, as well. Let's not forget, this thing called church is supposed to be a praying group of people. My house shall be called a house of prayer. But let me draw attention to Acts chapter 2 and verses, uh, those verses that were read, 38 to 47. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching or doctrine, to fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and to prayer. Uh, those who say that I can only come to church on Sunday, hmm. <laughs> and so you have no more time to pray. Hmm, not sure about that. Those who say they can't do Bible study or other such the like, uh, I don't know about that. This is what the early church did. And this is what has been proven from A.D. 33 and 34 <laughs> after uh, 30, 31, actually. This is what has been proven to build the church. In his book, The Unsaved Christian, listen to that title, The Unsaved Christian, Reaching Cultural Christianity with the Gospel, Pastor Dean in Sarah asserts a simple principle that gospel clarity is the antidote to the rampant confusion. He claims that the Gospels show that God makes demands, he meets them in Christ, and then he calls people to trust in and follow Jesus Christ. This is what the early church did. They devoted themselves. In fact, I looked at that word devote. Devote. That's how the 
King James Version, and I think the NIV actually says it as well, they devoted themselves. To devote oneself to something is to uh, give it preeminence, to give it importance and priority. Should I say that again? To devote oneself to something, anything, or someone means to give one's attention and priority to that thing. This is part of the reason why the seeker-sensitive, emergent type of churches, they do so well with numbers. But do like Barna research has done or Pew Research uh, have done. Do a research and ask them, how many of you really believe that Jesus Christ is God? And then that number begins to decrease. Because you have a lot of church goers, but not disciples. And that is a big part of the problem we face today. They devoted themselves to doctrine. Which is why you need to have a pastor who knows and practices the word and preaches the word. This is why we need... Listen, I, I, <laughs> I, I heard a preacher recently say that David and Jonathan had a kind of relationship which mirrors that which is being promoted today. It's a big, big preacher. Thousands of people. In fact, for example, uh, some of the people, <laughs> there's so much things going through my mind I'd like to share with you. Listen, in fact, one of the uh, preachers who I mentioned earlier, they have churches in the U.S., in Japan, in Norway, in Sweden, in Australia. Can you imagine spreading that kind of heresy and blasphemy? We're in the Scripture. Which translation? And by the way, they do have new Bibles now, by the way. I hope you know that. They have new Bibles. In fact, one person running to be president has his own Bible. Printed in China. I, I, I don't know. But where do you find that David and Jonathan had this special relationship that is coincidentally similar to what's been promoted today. Nothing in the scripture says that. Nothing. Nothing in the culture says that. Nothing in the uh, epistemology, nothing in the, under, the research and understanding of the origin of that thing or those things. Nothing says that. But I hear Jesus say, uh, I... I no longer call you brothers and so on. I call you friends. The scripture tells me there's a friend that sticks closer than a brother. That's what David and Jonathan had. They had a bond in spirit. Some of you can speak to that. I, I, have a, I have a brother from another mother who died about eight or nine years ago. Uh, I, I tell you, you would think we were from the same household. How we were close. How did, we, how did that bond come about? We, we got saved the same time. And so we served the Lord. We, we, and whenever he was weak, I would pull him back. What does the scripture say? It's, it's a bad thing when there's only one, because if you fall in a ditch, there's nobody to help you. But when there are two, 
And, and so when I was weak, he would, he, would, he would help me. So doctrine, fellowship, breaking of bread, like we do on the first Sunday, and prayer. By the way, they did breaking of bread not every first Sunday. They did it every week. And well, that's where the Brethren Church, by the way, got that from. They do communion every week. As often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you show forth the Lord's death until he comes. Right? That's what the word said. And so they do it every week. Doctrine, fellowship, breaking of bread, and prayer. I, I could spend time through each of these, but I shall not. But I want to take you down to verse 47. And the Lord added to the church those who were being saved. When we do those things that lift Jesus higher, that are Christocentric, God adds to the church those who shall be saved. He does it. So I want to just you know, um, give you some little bit of bad news, but there's good news. The bad news is that the pastor is not the one who's going to build the church. It's Jesus. But Jesus is going to build this church because we are his body. He is the head. We are the body. We're going to follow his commands and his instruction through the Holy Spirit. And when we do that, he adds to the church because the Holy Spirit has a way of speaking to our hearts and our minds that nobody else can. And that's what the early church did. How then do we allow Jesus to build the church with us? We should devote ourselves to these things. Let me close. Jesus Christ is the rock on which a church is built. And that is why we must become, if we are not yet, Christocentric. Our lives, our church should revolve around Jesus Christ and what he does and says. The church is, special, is a special community then that lift Jesus higher, that is focused on Christ. The church is God's medium for transformation. In that passage I quoted earlier, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 17, all the way down to 20. By the way, verse 17, that was my memory verse when I got baptized. My pastor said, that's your verse. And uh, it's... I'll tell you more about that later on. Uh, uh, for the, the following verse of, For God was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself and has given us the ministry of reconciliation. How is God going to transform Alexandria? Through us. And like I, I always say, you don't need to be able to preach like Paul or sing like Miriam or Maddie. Yes. <laughs> you, you don't need to be able to do that. You, you can play the guitar. Oh, great. You can play the piano. Wonderful. Uh, you, you, can, you, you can come alongside someone and, 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 and empathize with them. Do that. Do that. Here are the implications and application. If Jesus' claims are valid, the implications are life-altering and life-threatening. Altering if we embrace what he says. Therefore, if anyone be in Christ is a new creation. He makes all things new. Behold, all things are become 
new, the King James Version puts it. There's a song I love to sing, Change my heart, O God, make it ever true, comes out of a psalm. Change my heart, O God. That's how, how David prayed in Psalm 51 when he fell. Because he realized his heart still needed to be changed even though he loved and was serving God, he fell. Change my heart, O God. If Jesus' claims are true, then it's inescapable that we deal with them. And how does revive stack up with these scales, prayer, doctrine, fellowship, breaking of bread? How do we stack up? Next week, I'm going to talk a little bit more about that. And what is Revive's vision and mission for the next 3, 5, 10, 20, 30, 40 years? And how is this vision integrated? Listen to this. How is this vision integrated in all our activities? How? That's the question we need to ask ourselves. If this body of, of disciples is the property of Jesus Christ, how must we conduct ourselves? I want to issue an invitation. I've uh, had the pleasure and, and honor of talking with some of you uh, at various times uh, over the last 12 weeks. Um, I want to encourage more of us to engage in this inquiry of ourselves first and our relationship with each other and the church. Because Jesus said in Matthew chapter 5 and verse 4, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for what? Righteousness. Because they, will, they shall be filled. Shall be filled. Let's pray. We thank you, O God, for your word. We pray that by your Holy Spirit, you would use the words and minister to all our hearts in the ways that only you know best. This is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Please stand for the benediction. <clears throat> Now may the God of peace, who through the blood of the eternal covenant brought back from the dead our Lord Jesus, that great shepherd of the sheep, equip you with every good thing for doing his will. And may he work in us that which is pleasing to him. Through Jesus Christ, to him be glory forever and ever. Amen. God bless you.